too late to leave now, so I guess so. <laughs> I was born into a very large family of landowners. We owned the land that we lived on, the fields that we worked, the well that provided us water, and the fruit and nut trees that often provided shade or a playtime snack. We lived off the land, and in my adolescent mind, we had everything that we needed. I had no concept of poverty, lack, or inequity until I started elementary school. I remember vividly one of the first times I noticed inequity. I believe it was second grade. My superior reading skills had afforded me a place in the coveted superstars group. We sat in the center of the room and we were called on to answer most of the teacher's questions. The bears were the slow readers in the class. They sat all the way at the back of the room in the corner. No matter, they were rarely invited to engage in classroom discussion or dialogue. No matter how much I liked being the center of attention, I still empathized with the embarrassment and shame of my classmates who were pushed to the margins. This was around the time that we moved from our family-owned home in rural Deshea County to a multifamily housing unit in Stuttgart. To this day, I love Stuttgart, but it had and it has its challenges. Equity is one. I oftentimes describe Stuttgart as a plantation. The factories are built as close to people's homes as they can get, and although jobs are plentiful, people work their fingers to the bone with little to show after necessities. Worked much too hard for far too little and discarded when their bodies wear out. It happened to my mom. When she hurt her back at a local factory, the company used workers' compensation laws to fight her claim. Doctors tried to force her back to work, and in the end, she still didn't recover what she was owed. She's disabled for life. Growing up in Stuttgart, educational, economic, and racial equity always eluded people that looked like me. Save the ministers and one or two teachers, I never knew or saw a black professional in Stuttgart. The only black lawyer and doctor that I knew were Claire and Heathcliff Huxtable, and they were on the Cosby Show. As a teen, I began to recognize the effect that the war on drugs was having on the black community. I knew that every race did drugs, but it seemed that African Americans were the only ones that were being arrested for it. There was a crack to cocaine disparity of 100 to 1, and every summer, without fail, the justice system took a wave of black men from the community to work for free in prisons and released a group of black men from prison to try to integrate back into society, many times unsuccessfully. And most of these men had been taken from their families for nonviolent drug offenses, drug dealers and drug addicts alike. I saw the voids that they left behind, and it didn't seem fair. Eventually, it was my classmates. It was the bears. Poverty has been puzzling to me. I mean, I can see the effects clearly, but I've always been astounded by how the lack of resources can shape one's life. Poor people are expected to pull themselves up by the straps of boots that they don't own. I'm still trying to buy my boots, but I know that I'm fortunate. I grew up in a single parent home with all the love that I could hold and all of the books, magazines, and newspapers that I could read. Ebony and Jet had told me I was beautiful long before the entire world tried to convince me that I wasn't. Because of my educational privilege, I get to see both sides of the coin more clearly. I also hear the counter arguments, count, counter arguments couched in privilege from both black and white folks alike. Why would you pay somebody $15 to flip a hamburger? I went to college, they can too. I now know that my educational privilege is what's saving my life, but too often, 
Many of my poor and minority classmates were labeled as faring less, less well than their white counterparts were. And many of the teachers didn't think that we could achieve. When my mom went to check me into Stuttgart schools, the counselor pretty much laughed in our faces when we told her that I had scored 98% on last year's standardized achievement test. We had to go home and get proof before she would enroll me in pre-AP classes. While in law school, one of my good friends shared a challenge with me. Along with her hope that I wouldn't cast a negative judgment on her because of it, her brother was facing the death sentence and it was her responsibility to regurgitate their life of loss, trauma, and neglect, and abuse in an effort to save her brother's life. Her brother was one of the bears, pushed to the margins since elementary school, and eventually funneled into the school-to-prison pipeline. I had finals, and I couldn't attend the trial with her, but I knew that I would do something. After graduation, I began working as executive director of the Arkansas Coalition to Abolish the Death Penalty, where I still work to eliminate capital punishment as an available sentence in the state of Arkansas and continue to build on the legacy of Governor Winthrop Rockefeller. In 2017, when the state of Arkansas set eight execution dates to be carried out in 10 days, litigators, other nonprofits, clergy, activists and organizers came together to fight that plan. While lawyers worked day and night on motions and appeals, we collected a quarter of a million signatures from concerned citizens all around the world. The state executed four men, but four were saved. Recently, I opened a law office in Stuttgart as a part of the UALR Bowen Law School's Rural Incubator to increase access to justice in rural areas. I sit on the board of Decarcerate, where we work to end mass incarceration, curb fines, fees and bail, and sharply reduce the use of solitary confinement in our state. I'm on the steering committee of the racial disparities in the Arkansas criminal justice system, where we educate our Kansans on the role that race plays in charges and sentencing, because we know that African Americans are over two times more likely to receive the death penalty than their white counterparts for a capital crime. Race in Arkansas can literally mean life or death. This work gets heavy and the winds are relative and few. But even though inequity is a reality in American life, I keep reminding myself to never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it's the only thing that ever has. We stand on the shoulders of giants that did and we can too. Rest in love, peace, and power, Representative John Walker. <laughs>